Hi! I'm Phil the Blythe, Hellenic polytheist, chronic overextender of self, and I'm back! I posted a little update one year anniversary slash recap of my crazy <laughs> April. This video has been a long time coming, not only in the fact that I took a month off, but also the fact that I, I think I started seriously researching Hecate about eight months ago. Actually, it would probably be nine months ago at this point. Guess what, folks? Uh, I still don't really understand her all that well. This video is probably one of the most intensive research videos I've done ever. I think that was kind of the reason why I took a break in April is that I felt extremely burned out. So I just kind of put everything on hold and now here I am to discuss the video that kind of tipped me over the edge. Between this video and my last video on Hecate, almost 60 single spaced pages of notes, primary and secondary sources. So strap in. <laughs> Recap. I mean, the best recap that you're going to get is going to be in my Hecate part one video, which I will link. I also recommend watching my Hellenistic Age video, which I will also link over here. I did that one before this because I wanted to set some cultural groundwork for Hecate and the Hellenistic Age. Both of these videos will help give you a backdrop for exploring the next iteration of Hecate from the Hellenistic Age and moving up to the 19th century. Basically, in the last video, I covered her origins and her development from goddess of childbirth to goddess of liminal spaces. We also debunked some misconceptions, specifically as she related to witchcraft, which I will rebunk. <laughs> Hecate seemed to be a highly localized goddess and seldom honored on her own during the classical age, and she really did not gain prominence until the Hellenistic age. Hecate in the Hellenistic era, finally, after months and months and months and months. We're gonna do this. As I just mentioned, my last video, I debunked some misconceptions about Hecate as she related to witchcraft, her fearsome nature, as well as her connection to the moon, specifically the triple moon. This section, I am going to complicate them. So complicated. You're welcome. <laughs> Hecate as the moon. Hecate began to be associated with the moon around the first century CE, which is at the tail end of the Hellenistic era. Remember when the Hellenistic era is, everybody? <laughs> the death of Alexander the Great to the rise of the Roman Empire. Her previous associations with the new moon had more to do with her associations with transition and transitioning from one month to another than the actual planetary body itself. But by the 5th century BCE, Hecate was already heavily associated with Artemis, uh, who herself would become associated with the moon a few centuries later in the 2nd century BCE. I talked actually a little bit about the connection between Hecate and Artemis before. That's kind of a long-standing connection is, is the two of them, both virgin goddesses who have to deal with childbirth and then became associated with the moon, kind of at the same time. There's a deep connection between Artemis and Hecate. I don't have time to go into the nuance of all of that. I would be here like a hundred years, but there is a deep connection between the two of them. Now we are going to head into weedy realms of philosophy together. I'm gonna be honest, I don't really understand a lot of Plutarch's writings, writings on the moon and souls and like a lot of philosophers at this time. It gets to in the mental realm and less out of the praxis realm, which is really what I am more interested in. The moon in many cases was thought to be associated with the dead and specifically the restless dead. Hecate is also seen as sharing titles as well as domain over the moon with Persephone. And in the Greek magical papyri, is seen as identical to Artemis, Selene, Ershigal, and Persephone. So if the PGM is talking about one of them, it's it's more like an aspect of this fearsome moon goddess that deals with necromancers. We're gonna 
talk about more about the moon in the in the Roman section. So speaking of the PGM, the PGM, aka the Greek magical papyri, is absolutely why this, the dates are pretty much from the Hellenistic age through Byzantium. So like they're not really all one book, but it is now compiled into a list of like it was scrolls papyri, and people have now compiled into one book that they call the Greek magical papyri. And it's just like this wild combination of syncretic spells and charms. And it's really hard to place on a timeline, but I'm gonna put it in the Hellenistic Age, just usually where people tend to discuss it. I'm going to be putting it here, partially because this is where I'm going to be talking the most about syncretism. As I previously mentioned, Hecate is seen as nearly identical to Artemis, Selene, Persephone, and the Mesopotamian goddess Ereshigal. 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 Er in fact, they are often invoked as epithets of one another. So that's where we get Artemis Hecate Selene, or Hecate Persephone Ershigal, or Hecate Ershigal. Here's a very fun charm. Charm of Hecate Ershigal against fear of punishment. If he comes forth, say to him, I am Ershigal, the one holding her thumbs, and not even one evil can befall her. The one holding her thumbs. Not quite sure that's supposed to mean? I guess try it as a defense in court and see how it works. Hecate Ershigal is also found in many lead curse tablets from the Hellenistic era. Another fascinating sink is that of Hermecate, which as you might be able to tell is Hermes Hecate. In my previous video on Hecate, I mentioned how Hermes and Hecate often cover very similar domains, which is why there's like a lot of debate as to where Hecate comes from because their domains overlap so much <laughs> that it's hard to parse out why there would be two separate deities that deal literally the same exact thing. However, at this time, Hermes is gaining his own reputation as a magician, especially as we get syncretisms with Egyptian pantheon, with Thoth. I can see how they kind of start to separate in the Hellenistic era as Hecate becomes more associated with like moon, moon magic, which fearsome goddess and Hermes becomes like magician, Mercury, uh, planetary astrology, and I can see how they would diverge and then kind of these new divergent aspects would then be called together, how that would be kind of seen as even more pow powerful to the magicians of the PGM. Another surprising sync, which I really glossed over in my Hellenistic Age video, is Hecate and Aphrodite. Aphrodite Zerinthia is among the number of the great gods of Samothraki, and some scholars consider this to be a sync or an aspect of Hecate. I didn't cover this in my Aphrodite video for reasons, but Aphrodite does have some death aspects, but most of them seem to come from Aphrodite's continuous syncretism with Persephone and in the case of this video that we're talking about, Hecate. Hello, it is Editing Blythe here. I just wanted to add that I had a lot of people ask me why I didn't include or if I didn't know about the quote unquote darker aspects of Aphrodite. I am aware of them. I was aware of them at the time. I just elected not to include them because honestly, they are way more complicated than the internet makes them out to be. And I felt that they were completely out of the scope of that video and also out of the scope of this video. So that is why I don't go into a whole lot of depth because I felt like at the time and I still kind of feel like I don't have the quality of information that I feel I should provide. So that's that on that. In the PGM itself, there's actually a reference to Hecate as Dione, which is another name for Aphrodite or maybe her mother. Things are confusing. But generally, Dione is seen as like an aspect of Aphrodite or connected to Aphrodite in some way. This love charm is an incredibly syncretic hymn. I'll actually read a selection of it for you now, so you can see just how far reaching Hecate, who is also Persephone, who is also Artemis, who is also Selene, who is also Ershigal, who is also Hermes, and is now also apparently Aphrodite is. It's my beautiful PGM. I love it. Oh, good. My, my cat vet reminder appointment card is here marking this page. Come, giant Hecate, Dionys guard, O Persia, Baobo, Forene, dart shooter, unconquered Lydian, the one untamed. Sire nobly, torch-bearing guide who bends down. Proud necks, Kore, here, you who've parted. Gates of steel unbreakable, O Artemis, who too were once protectress, mighty one, mistress who burst forth from the earth, dog leader, all tamer, crossroad goddess, triple-headed, bringer of light, august, virgin, I call you. Fawn slayer, crafty, O infernal one, and many formed. Come, Hecate, goddess of three ways, who, with your fire-breathing phantoms, have been allotted dreaded roads and harsh enchantments. 
Hecate, I call you with those who have timely passed away and with those heroes who have died without a wife and children hissing wildly, yearning in their hearts. I'm going to cut to the end because I don't really want to read the entire hymn out loud. But you, O Hecate of many names, O virgin, core, goddess, come, I ask, O guard and sh shelter of the threshing floor, Persephone, O triple-headed goddess, who walk on fire, cow-eyed, and now a bunch of verbal charms that I will not say out loud. Yeah, so straight up just calls her Persephone. Kore is the, like, spring virgin goddess aspect of Persephone. Yeah, a very wild hymn there. Straight up calls her an aspect of Aphrodite, calls her Artemis, calls her Persephone, calls her Kore. Like, they're not even talking to different goddesses that they are all talking to the same goddess. A lot of gods and goddesses gained underworld aspects. A lot of this had to do with syncretisms between Mesopotamian cultures and syncretization with the Egyptian pantheon. I mentioned this in my Hellenistic video that the goddess Isis was pretty much syncretized with every possible Greek goddess. And yes, this includes Hecate and Aphrodite. In fact, Hecate and Aphrodite are both considered aspects of Isis. Hecate, demons, and necromancy. As we head towards the end of early antiquity, the daemons of centuries past begin to have a transformation. Daemons, for those unfamiliar, at their earliest incarnations were the spirits of things. Emotions, ideas, concepts such as time, grace, happiness, lust, hate, etc. In fact, there's debate on if early Greek gods were considered daemons. It's you see them a lot of times referred to as O Daemon something. I'm not getting into that debate. If you want to have that debate, have it in my comments. But as we truck out of the classical and into the Hellenistic era, daemons gain a new dimension, an idea of a guiding spirit. This idea was prominently put forth by Socrates. Uh, in which this daemon represents a guide of sorts who is unique and individual to the person. Heading deeper into the Hellenistic and especially into late antiquity, daemons gained a more sinister aspect. Lost souls or spirits who had a nebulous existence between man, god, life, and death. They became lumped in with phantoms and restless spirits, and so Hecate, who is the leader of them both, became the leader of these new daemons too. And thus Hecate as their queen began to gain some of their more nefarious and fearsome aspects. This brings us back to the moon. The daemons and phantoms were thought to reside on the moon. Now let's go to where these con concepts really took hold and formed together. That's right folks, we're finally going to where all roads inevitably lead. We're going to Rome. <laughs> Hecate in Rome. Many of our most famous myth tellings come not out of Greece, actually, but from the wild imaginations of the Romans. Ovid being the most common offender, Ovid tied Hecate unquestionably to witchcraft, necromancy, and the moon. But it wasn't just Ovid who did this. Many writers at this time ushered in a new goddess into this already complicated Hecate syncretism equation. Enter Diana. Stage right. <laughs> This is my right, as is your right. <clears throat> this is from Aeneid, book four. Dido laments. But when the pyre of cut pine and oak was raised high, in an innermost court open to the sky, the queen hung the place with garlands and wreathed it with funeral foliage. She laid his sword and clothes and picture on the bed, not unmindful of the ending. Altars stand round about, and the priestess with loosened hair intoned the names of three hundred gods, of Erebus, Chaos, and the triple Hecate, the three faces of the virgin Diana. Additionally, in book seven of the Aeneid, Virgil calls Lake Nemi, also known as the Mirror of Diana and her grove, Trivia's Lake. Now, Trivia is the Roman name for Hecate. Trivia meaning three ways. Bit of trivia for you there. <laughs> Remember the moon? Yeah. This is where we start to get a very interesting, dare I say it, proto triple moon goddess. I'll go more in depth into that a bit later. Catullus states in a poem to Diana that she is a maiden, daughter of Jove and Latone, also Zeus and Leto for the Greek syncretisms there. She is a mistress of the mountains and wild places. And he goes on to say of Diana, 
You are called Juno Lucina by women suffering in childbirth. You are mighty trivia, and by its familiar light are called the moon. You, goddess, measure the monthly course of the year. Varro, a contemporary of Catullus, has the following to say. Titan-born trivia is Diana, and she is called trivia, perhaps because she is said to be the moon, which moves along three paths from heaven, in altitude, latitude, and longitude. What is that? Now, I feel like I have been kind of lacking in mentioning probably one of the most important syncretisms with Diana is that of Artemis. Keep that in mind. Diana has so far been syncretized with Artemis, a maiden goddess, and now with Juno, who is uh, specifically Juno Lucina, who is Juno, the mother who is helping women in childbirth. Now, I can I feel like I can already hear people like, starting to scream. <laughs> I promise my, co my my whole thing here is not to prove the existence of the triple goddess, but I'm laying the groundwork for how it became developed. Does that make sense? Porphyry, page 38. What is that? Is that on my Hecate Soterra book? It is! Here I will let Porphyry speak for himself. This is from Hecate Soterra by Sarah Isles Johnston. But again, the moon is Hecate and is the symbol of her varying phases and of her power, which is dependent on those phases. For this reason, her power appears in three forms, the figure in white robes, golden sandals, and lighted torches being the symbol of the new moon. The basket which she bears when she is mounted high is the symbol of the cultivation of crops, which she causes to grow according to the increasing amount of light she gives. The symbol of the full moon is the goddess wearing brazen sandals, or one might judge from the branch of olive she carries that she is of a fiery nature. One might also judge from the poppy that she is productive and that a multitude of souls dwell within her, just as if when within a city, for the poppy is the symbol of the city. There very much Porphyry is very directly tying Hecate to the three phases of the moon. Back to Diana. Diana Nemorensis, Diana of the Lake Nemi, was depicted as a three-formed goddess. One form was the Huntress, the other a goddess of the moon, and the final was of Hecate herself as goddess of the underworld. Diana Nemorensis would gain notoriety in the 19th century with Sir James George Fraser and the Golden Bough. I could do a whole thing. I mean, many people have talked about the influence of the Golden Bough on neo-paganism. This Golden Bough would lead to the eventual creation of the Leland's Aradia, Gospel of the Witches, and once this comes onto the scene, Hecate and Diana will never be seen the same again. Aradia, the goddess of witchcraft, which is the daughter of Diana Nemorensis with Lucifer. Not that Lucifer, this is Luciferus, a Roman entity, but not a deity. Uh, Luciferus has no myths that I could find. His inclusion in Fraser's story may or may not have been an edgy Victorian interpretation, but we're not quite in the 19th century yet. We're still in the very early CE. Speaking of Lucifer and his interpretations, we are going to go back to the late Roman era and specifically the beginnings of early Byzantium, in which Hecate once again takes us for a surprising ride. This time, though, through the lens of early Christianity and Gnosticism. Hecate in the early Christian period. It is taken me so long to figure out how I even want to begin <laughs> to talk about this next section. It is so out of my depth that I feel like I'd have to make at least three other videos in order to cover just how deep this goes. But luckily, many of the topics have been covered by channels way different than mine, so I will be linking those up here where I can. Unless I've already run out of cards, in which case I'll be linking them in the description. Before we talk about this next section, we need to set the groundwork for early Christianity, specifically Gnosticism. I'm gonna try to make this as uncomplicated as possible. I highly recommend this playlist from this amazing channel, Religion for Breakfast, for an in-depth explanation on all things early Christianity and Gnosticism. But the basics are this. The church in late antiquity was by no means a unified front. There was not a unified Bible, let alone a unified theology. Many early so-called Christians even included gods and spirits from their cultural cosmologies. One of those gods that gets included is, you guessed it, Hecate. Gnostic theology is as diverse as the individuals who practice it. The biggest way to understand it is this. Gnostics believe, generally, 
again, this is all generalized. Please don't like, you know, scream at me in the comments. Gnostics believe in the monad, the highest form of divine source. This is also sometimes called the one or the first paternal intellect. This is the highest source of light and divinity. Monadic concepts existed actually as far back as the Pythagoreans. Many proto-Gnostics believe that all pagan gods were just various emanations of the monad. I touched on the idea of the one source and emanations in my Hellenistic polytheism video, where I talked a bit about pagan monotheism. Told you it was going to be important for this video. Enter Sophia. Sophia is the lowest emanation of the monad and is sometimes called the world soul. Have you heard that term before? Yes, it does come from Greek philosophy. Sophia, wisdom, then gives birth by herself to the demiurge, or demiurgos if you're Plato, which roughly translates to skilled worker. Now the world soul and the demiurge are all concepts attested as early as Plato. And if you're curious to know how the ancient Greek philosophers viewed these concepts, I recommend Eliakai's video on the concepts of the soul in ancient Greece. The demiurge then created the material world, and according to certain Gnostics, is the god that mainstream Christians worshipped, and Gnostics still believe that today, generally, that the god that mainstream Christians worship is actually the demiurge, which is this flawed world creator. Unlike this mainstream Christian god, the demiurge is inherently flawed and created a flawed world. Gnostics believe that we must turn away from this flawed god and turn instead to the monad. You can probably tell why Gnosticism has primarily existed in secrecy. Jesus is a heavily debated figure in Gnosticism, where certain groups view him as a pretender, but the most mainstream form of Gnosticism, which like, even saying mainstream Gnosticism is like an oxymoron, but the, the most popular form of Gnosticism sees Jesus as the monad made flesh who is here to help humanity turn back to the monad. And then together with Sophia, who has, has experienced remorse for bringing about this flawed creator by herself without help from the paternal intellect, they are trying to fix the world and help people's souls reach enlightenment. In fact, there's a pretty sick verse from the Gnostic Bible that goes something along the lines of, who are you, God asked, and Sophia replied, I am your mother. Like, ooh, <laughs> I hope that you survived that discussion. And I'm honestly amazed that I survived it at all. Like I had to, it took me hours to come up with something that made a little bit of sense. So how does Hecate figure into all of this? Like Sophia's great, wonderful Felicity, but where does Hecate show up? Well, in traditional Gnosticism, specifically in the Gnostic text, Pistis Sophia, it is said, the third order is called triple-faced Hecate. And there are under her authority seven and twenty arch demons, and it is they which enter into men and seduce them to perjuries and lies and to covet that which doth not belong to them. So in traditional Gnosticism and early Christianity, Hecate is seen as the queen of hell and commander of demons. A reputation, as I mentioned, she gained in the Roman period, but not all Gnostics saw her in an evil light. No, no. Enter the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans are a mysterious group who guarded their secrets of origin very well. Chaldea was generally referred to as part of Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. However, the most prominent Chaldean, Julian the Theurgist, may or may not have been a Babylonian Chaldean, Babylonian Chaldean, came to be associated with magicians. Some magicians just adopted the title regardless of ethnicity. So like not all Chaldeans were from Chaldea. Either way, Julian the Chaldean claimed that these oracles were delivered to him via trance. No primary source on the oracles remain, unfortunately, only in later writings referring to them. The Chaldeans are actually mentioned at least 66 times in the canon of the modern Bible. To the Chaldeans, Hecate is Sophia. Except instead of giving birth to the Demiurge, she gave birth to the entire cosmos itself. To the Chaldeans, Hecate represented the line between material and divine, and so through her, the Chaldeans believed that they could reach enlightenment and return to the first paternal intellect. Now, if the idea of Hecate as holder of the keys of the entire cosmos sounds familiar, that's because the Orphics, who I tend not to include because they are so hotly freaking debated, but the Orphic hymn to Hecate includes that line of Hecate is the key holder to the entire cosmos. So when you see people throw that around, just know that it, it comes from these mystery traditions. This is why, to the Chaldeans, she is Hecate Sotera. If 
you are interested in Hecate, I'm sure you've seen people use that epithet before, Hecate Soterra, Hecate as savior. In fact, there has been very fascinating scholarship done comparing Hecate, who is called Soterra, to Jesus, who is called Soter. Both Hecate and Jesus are seen as guiding figures from life to death and sometimes back again, and helping the world reach enlightenment. I will link an article written by uh, a reverend, actually, on the matter, and it, it has some amazing, not before translated, dedications to Hecate Soterra. So I will link that out down below. <clears throat> towards modern Hecate. The three witches in Macbeth, an old hag leading the wild hunt. Hecate was rife for the imagination of the poets, playwrights, and artists of the Renaissance and the Elizabethan eras. She is almost always depicted as a wicked old wise woman, often triple, and occasionally syncretized with the concept of the wild hunt in Northern European folklore, and then seen again during the witches' Sabbath during the witch crazes of the 16th through 17th centuries. I mean, there were others, but that's the big one. Hecate danced on the fringes of society, but did not really see true praxis beyond poetry until... the Victorian age. <laughs> I know, I'm finally gonna do it. I'm finally gonna talk about the religious practices and beliefs of the Victorian age, and I'm gonna be neutral about it. I'm gonna be neutral about it. I'm gonna be neutral. <laughs> the bullshittery that <laughs> Victorians were obsessed with ancient Greek and Roman mythology, and the resulting obsession coupled with the exploration of the classics field, psychology, <clears throat> archeology, span Spiritualism and industrialization created a world in which people began to question religious dogma in a very serious manner. I mean, people have always, there have always been heretics, there have always been divisions, but this was the first time that it was happening on a much more mainstream level. Like, mainstream is not really what the word here, but it, it happened on a much larger level, I would say, a much more collective level. Many people looked backwards and formed a unique relationship with the religion not seen in the so-called West for hundreds of years. If you want to hear me talk, scream, more about how spirituality in the Victorian age came to be and how it irrevo irrevocably changed spirituality forever, yes, your spirituality probably has touches of Victorianism in it, and we have to find ways to live with that. Check out this TTAC episode, my podcast, Test Tubes and Cauldrons, with my wonderful co-host. Again, if I ran out of cards, that's going to be in the description. I touched briefly on some of this while talking about Diana Nemorensis, but by the 19th century, Hecate as triple goddess was something everyone was obsessed with. Whether that was Maiden Mother Crone, Triple Moon, etc. Not my boy L.R. Farnell, though. He only valid Victorian. <laughs> Sorry, neutral. He thought that it was poetic imaginations of people past and present. What a king. Despite what previously thought, Robert Graves was actually not the first to propose Hecate as the triple moon goddess. And even his triple moon goddess theory is kind of misunderstood. There, I said it. <laughs> I'll link to an article that goes in that particular rabbit hole if you're very curious. I'll link that down below. But in his original writings of the, his original retellings of the Greek myths, he mentions that the three ages of women being like the three fates. And like the fates are three, and the moon is three, so the life of a woman is three. He links the new moon to the mating goddess of the spring, the full moon to the nymph goddess of the summer, not mother, nymph goddess of the summer, and finally, the waxy moon as the chrome goddess of the autumn. It seems that Graves saw the syncretized Artemis Hecate Selene, or as Corey Persephone Hecate Demeter, as a triple moon goddess, which, by all accounts, is not incorrect. The original idea was made in nymph crone, in which the final stage is the queen of the underworld. Nymph also means bride and not just nymphs as nature spirits. And when looking at Persephone, she does go from maiden to bride to queen of the underworld. Graves also posited Hera as a triple goddess, since Hera is maiden bride widow, and this 
is seen throughout the classical era. The idea of Hecate alone as the maiden mother crone seems to actually be a result of later misinterpretation of Graves' writing. So Graves' triple moon, goddess Hecate, was always Hecate as syncretized with other goddesses, not just Hecate alone. Which, again, I can't believe I'm saying this, is not actually wholly incorrect. <laughs> I talked about this at length when talking about the PGM of Hecate was seen as being aspects of these goddesses, these nebulous moon goddesses. So Graves was not an idiot. As much as I like to dunk on the Victorians and the Edwardians, we have to remember that like a lot of these people, they, they weren't always just talking out of their freaking buttholes. <laughs> they were well studied in classics, many times beyond classics. Many of them were, were actually scholars in other uh, cosmologies, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, they are, these thoughts are coming from somewhere. It's, it's not the whole, like, it came to me in a dream. But anyway, Hecate's journey in the modern world was really only beginning at this point, and it doesn't reach its full modern interpretation until we have the advent of the duotheistic religion, Wicca. The triple goddess was adopted by Wicca pretty early on, as well as by many other neo-pagan groups, like the Church of All Worlds. The idea of the triple moon goddess was furthered by analytic psychologist Carl Jung, which fed back into Wicca and eclectic neo-paganism, which was heavily, heavily influenced by Jung's writings. Dianic Wicca is probably the tradition that solidified Hecate's triple moon, maiden mother crone, goddess of witchcraft that we see her today. Conclusion, I hope I get through this without my camera dying. As we have seen, Hecate has gone through quite a transformation from intermediary guide to salvatrix of all the universe to queen of hell, feared and maligned, and then to a reclaimed triple goddess of witchcraft. My Hecate series is not done. Uh, in two weeks, I have a very special conclusion. Well, how much can we ever really conclude about the goddess of liminality and mystery? <laughs> if this series has taught me anything, it's that certain deities can only be known by those who have praxis with them, and they continue to reveal their mysteries across generations. I don't want anyone to think that any of this is a ha, -ha gotcha, like this thing came from the 19th century, this was then, and then it was rediscovered, like, Deities reveal their mysteries to you, to their practitioners. Okay, my camera literally just died, so I have like five seconds before it dies again. Let deities uh, evolve. Let religions evolve. As always, I'll link my source in the description. Pop in with any questions, and I will see you in a couple weeks. Bye. Sorry for the chaotic end, but um, yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>